I'm your host, Hillary Bricken, and this is the Cannabis Law Now podcast, where we regularly discuss issues related to the cannabis industry, including investment, day-to-day operational issues, and potential reform on the horizon that will impact all cannabis businesses and investors in the United States. So for today's episode, I have a really exciting guest, in my opinion, because he is probably in the most exciting segment of cannabis these days. If you ask, I think anyone, or at least every social media post I get, everything I see in marketing and advertising points to the popularity of THC infused beverages. And to talk about that today, and specifically his company, which I think is blowing up, he can attest to that, is Adam Terry, CEO and co-founder of Cantrip. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. Hi, Hillary. Thanks for having me. Yes. Okay. So usually in this podcast, it's very conversational. We want to know about cantrip. We want to know about how you're navigating, I think, what some would call the precarious legal area of these THC-infused beverages because of the farm bill. And we'll get into that. You can share as much or as little as you want. But can you tell our audience, what is cantrip? So Cantrip is a hemp-derived THC beverage company. We actually started out making what you might call marijuana-infused beverages, for lack of a better term, working with licensed co-packers here in Massachusetts. Now we've entirely moved our operations into the hemp side of the business. Cantrip itself is a word that means a mischievous or playful trick. I pulled it from Dungeons and Dragons, but it's essentially you know, a call to the concept that these beverages were originally designed, designed to be low dose and approachable for everybody. And cantrip in Dungeons and Dragons is essentially a level zero spell that you know most people have a cantrip or two that they can cast. So it's you know just a little bit of magic to add to your life. I love it. My next question was going to be, how did you come up with that name? But you already have answered that. And, you know, just so we all know, and to reiterate, you started on the state licensed cannabis side in Massachusetts, which is a highly regulated state. Comparing these two industries together, the highly regulated state licensed side and the hemp derived side, which I think is mainly evolving. Were you sad to depart the state licensed cannabis industry? Well, you know, I've been in adult use and medical cannabis since 2015, originally on California for a couple of years and then here in Massachusetts from 2017 through 2020. And, you know, I have a lot of friends in the space, a lot of friends in the dispensary system. I guess we were in this space until last year, 2023. So that would make about six years in Massachusetts. I've watched it evolve from a vertically integrated medical space into an adult use, you know, licensed cannabis space. And no, I wasn't really sad to leave any of them. I I still go see my friends from occasion. I still go to dispensaries. They still exist all over the place. But, uh, you know, I think adult use cannabis policy in this country, and particularly in the state of Massachusetts, has been a little bit haphazard in terms of how they approach what is appropriate and what's not to be sold in dispensary. I think it's it's largely focused on anti-diversion laws and preventing, you know, cannabis from ending ending on the hands of anyone they deem is unfit to have cannabis. I think that's especially fair in some cases, and especially unfair in other cases. But it's, you know, it's a system that favors and focuses on security and anti-diversion, which are very important things, but it lacks any sophistication when it comes to particularly what I've done for my career, which is extracts and infusions in which they're essentially treated the same as smokable flour for you know testing purposes, for transport purposes. And you just have a, there's, there's no nuance or sophistication when it comes to any product downstream of the plant itself. I still think after being in the space for a decade plus, there's huge room for innovation right, in the state legal industries when we're dealing with what I'll call, quote unquote, marijuana, as opposed to cannabis, which in my opinion would include these hemp derived products, but that it's been so elementary for years because of these state laws and the fact that the Department of Justice weighed in on what it wanted to see and that made mainly products and consumers suffer as a result. But what people may not know is that you're a chemist by training. So, you know, given that political legal framework for the state licensed industries. What drew you to these hemp derived beverages, this particular segment as a chemist? So I'm actually a chemical engineer. So both chemists and chemical engineers would get mad at me if I didn't mention that because there, there's a distinction when it comes down to practicality. But, uh, you know, I've done a lot of things in the in the chemistry range when it comes to cannabis. And you know, when I first joined the industry, my focus was on applying process engineering principles primarily to extraction. You ensure efficient extraction of the target molecule, which is THC. The I wouldn't say it's as a chemist that anything drew me to the hemp side of the business. I mean, there is, I suppose, 
within that, there's the, the fact that Delta 9 THC is Delta 9 THC, whether it comes from hemp or marijuana. It's, you know, to your point, cannabis is both hemp and marijuana. It's the same plant. The dividing line between it is an arbitrary point that was selected you know, uh, largely to try to prevent any sort of intoxicating products from existing, which is kind of the natural result of having prohibition so long there was no one left in government who had ever heard of an edible. You know, the Delta 9 THC being the same, it was, it was pretty appealing. There are some nuances that come down in the chemistry range of what what is the difference between D9 and THC when it comes from hemp versus when it comes from marijuana. A lot of that comes down to how it's extracted and put into the product. You know, primarily in hemp, there are two methods of getting to Delta 9 THC. One is converting CBD into Delta 9 THC, which is something as a chemical engineer, I'm not a huge fan of because of the potential for byproducts in reaction chemistry. And then there is natural extraction, which means taking quite a lot of hemp and concentrating it down into you know distillate and then re-diluting it back into your product and so you know from a from a, a chemical perspective it's is largely the exact same product my products are identical to the ones that we used to create here for the Massachusetts dispensary system the biggest difference being that as a small business owner and as somebody who has you know, is not well connected to massive amounts of capital the ability to operate a business is materially different on the hemp side as it is in the marijuana side and that's you know anybody who's in the don't use cannabis system is aware of the high barrier to entry, but Cantrip started as sort of a licensing company where we would license these products to adult use manufacturers for production and sale to dispensary systems and then on to consumers. And what that led to is a very difficult, you know, cash situation for any small business, which is that essentially from the time I would buy a, a single can to fill with my products to the time I got paid for that can, you know, a finished product could be something like six to eight months. And so that is an enormous amount of money to be laying out for an enormous amount of time, especially in an industry that has no financing. So I'd say the case was large one of business, total addressable market demands, you know, consumer friction and marketing. But from you know the chemistry perspective, it's it's great because I can make the same product. It just happens to be made from a plant that is designated in a different legal manner. Let's talk about that legal manner. I still think there's a ton of confusion about what the 2018 Farm Bill does and does not allow, mainly colored by policy and intent. Um, You have some in the camp that say this wasn't the intention of Congress where these other hemp-derived cannabinoids could slip through the net, right, and intoxicate people so long as the finished product contains less than 0.3% THC. You have other people very vocally saying no. This is kosher. This is not a loophole. This is the actual law. And these are totally valid products. No question. Then you have the third camp that's probably somewhere in the middle. And you've got the states that are now kind of catching on and they're starting to regulate or others are starting to ban. What is your take, especially as the CEO of Cantrip? And like I've said before, I see you guys everywhere. And it really seems like you're making hay. You're in interstate commerce. It's it's kind of a great cannabis success story in a way. And the packaging looks great. Kudos to you. It looks like a very sophisticated, cool product. But on the farm bill, how do you make peace with that? So there, there's a lot of stuff in there. I think I probably am in the camp that's somewhere, you know, in between. There's a lot that goes on in cannabis. As I mentioned, I don't think the adult use cannabis programs actually do a great job of regulating cannabis in an appropriate way. I don't think they allow for cannabis to make the products that people actually want in the way that they actually want them. And I think that starts at the point of flower. And I think that goes all the way through finished products where, you know, for years on the seed to sales side of things, when I would be, be operating in extractions, there was no good methodology in those seed to sales systems for turning flour into extract within the system. You basically had to hack the systems or like make up new formats and units because the system did, was you know created specifically and only for flour. This goes back to the days of Biotrack and it moves through metric, you know, where essentially none of these seed to sales softwares are really built you know, to handle an extraction system and then down through infusions. But as far as the law goes, I mean, you can call something a loophole, you can not call it a loophole. I believe it's incumbent upon lawmakers to write laws that meet the intent that they have. If they have an intent that nothing should be intoxicated then they shouldn't have written a rule that allowed things to be intoxicating. I mean, the farm bill certainly was, on the face of it, it, you know, intended to create a system for creating industrial hemp that could go into fibers, it could be used for lignin, it could be used for biofuels. And all of those things have happened and have done. The problem is, when you have a plant that has been prohibited for an extremely long time, there's no one in the civil service left who has any concept of what's going on with cannabis. Frankly, if you had any idea of what was going on with cannabis in this country, you wouldn't be allowed in the civil service because they drug test, as far as I'm aware. And so when they drafted these hemp rules, I don't really think they had a strong sense of that. The 
original rules that they adopted in the Farm Bill actually go back to Colorado's law. I think that passed in 2013. And that was, I think, largely driven by Bob Hoban, who, you know, was an attorney who drove the bus when it came to him getting that law passed. I, I listened to a great interview with him on a different podcast where he talked about exactly how they came up with that 0.3%. But largely speaking, it's arbitrary. The fact is, if you smoke flour, there's only 0.3% delta 9 THC. You will not really get intoxicated and be like smoking hay. It's not really going to get you anywhere. But when you concentrate that down into, or when you not concentrate it down, but when you put it into an edible, you can deliver an absolute number of cannabinoids as long as you increase the mass in which it's measured against. So if you have a gummy that is standard, say, three gram gummy size, you could deliver up to nine milligrams of THC without it being, you know, not compliant with the farm bill. There's a lot of, you know, murky gray area in that too, where, you know, it's not totally clear, you know, what constitutes a dry weight basis. A dry weight basis for flour could be considered two different things. You could consider a dry weight basis as if you took the plant, dried it out in a crucible and removed all moisture. But, you know, if you're talking about a representative sample of what's going to actually end up on the market, usually dry cannabis to closer where it's about 25 to 30% moisture remaining. So I'm not really sure what's interpreted by the USDA there. There's also the fact that a USDA compliant farm, the USDA rules in, include precursors when they measure total delta 9 THC, essentially. They measure what is the potential to become the delta 9 THC. So that includes THCA. And, you know, because of that USDA rule, I don't believe that THCA flour is actually compliance, which is a departure from a lot of hemp stuff. They also just didn't consider any synthetic cannabinoids whatsoever, which I think is a, is a huge policy problem and is being addressed state by state. And so when you have all of these, you know, murky areas, basically, it kind of reminds me a lot of Prop 215 in California, where the, you know, because it was a ballot initiative, the rules weren't very long. It was essentially medical marijuana is now legal <laughs> and you have to be part of a collective and like, a, here's a couple rules, but mostly from there, you know, you start with flour and then you end up in 2015 with a robust market of all sorts of stuff and, you know, nonprofit companies that are, you know, with air quotes, that become profitable companies in that space. But, you know, with the farm bill, you end up with this just generally lax rule that doesn't help any, you know, help understand any of these points. And I, that's why I think so many attorneys are confused. It's just, there's no clarity. A lot of it comes down to what has been litigated and what hasn't been litigated, what has been forced and hasn't been enforced, which administrative agencies under the U.S. federal government have a jurisdiction here. And then you have the whole CBD problem with the FDA. It was only six months prior to the Farm Bill passing with this hemp rule that the FDA approved its first pharmaceutical featuring CBD. And to date, this has been the, one of the biggest headaches the FDA has had to face where they don't really know how to regulate it because there is a rule that says CBD can't be in food and uh, beverage products specifically because it is in a pharmaceutical. And so how do you square that circle? Well, the FDA hasn't really figured that out. They went back to Congress a year ago and said, we don't know what to do. You guys have to pass a rule. We know that Congress has no interest in passing a rule. And there's just, there's so many ways it can go on. But the, to bring it all back to where we ended up with the states, you know, Minnesota essentially decided as a state, this isn't a loophole. This is exactly how the Farm Bill rule uh, reads. And we're going to regulate this. So here's how we're going to do it. So they passed some cursory laws in 2022 that gave, you know, a five milligram per serving limit, 10 milligrams per container. They went on to refine those rules and, and when they actually legalized cannabis the next year that those were some great rules that in fact they restricted some of the products i make i still think those are great rules they ban synthetic cannabinoids i think we know too little about those to claim that they're safe in any way they really started to create a system of enforcement so for example products have been pulled in minnesota they don't have coas if they don't have coas that are within 10 percent variance of the target potency they have pulled over packaging regulations so hemp is not an unregulated system. It is still regulated state by state, and it is self-regulated by the companies that operate. So Cantra, I just went through a, a huge label review, and I was able to get lab make labels that are compliant in only 34 states, as far as I can tell. And that's only because a lot of those states don't have rules yet. Just like the adult use cannabis system, states keep passing their own individual rules. And in fact, I have to now, because the Florida bill that just passed, what, a week ago, I now have to actually add one more thing to those labels to then be compliant in Florida if I'm going to sell there. So, you know, <laughs> there there is a group called the Hemp Beverage Alliance, which advocates for self-regulation and bringing regulation to the hemp space on a federal level. So we have one unified system. All of us are asking to be taxed. All of us are asking to, you know, make this codified in some way, shape, or form. And in the meantime, most of us are self-regulating. So I produce the same quality with the same COA as I would on the marijuana side. Right on. I mean, oh, the irony of going from adult use cannabis just to another patchwork quilt of regulation <laughs> on the hemp side. And it seems that states fall into one of two categories. They either try to ban it 
get challenged legally, and I don't think they've had much success in maintaining those bans because of federal preemption. Or they are regulating, and they probably need a good amount of education, just like they did with these other democratic experiments with cannabis from stakeholders, policy people, etc. Now, you mentioned synthetic cannabinoids, and I should qualify that under the farm bill, for everybody listening, the threshold is 0.3% THC. Anything below that is industrial hemp. Anything above that is a Schedule One controlled substance that is illegal with the caveat that these synthetic cannabinoids are also controlled substances. Adam, when you see these other companies out there on the free market advertising things like THCA, Delta 8, Delta 10, you know, CBG, any of these other many, many cannabinoids in the plant, do you think the good majority of them are doing this through synthetic derivation extraction, or do you think it's natural? What's your take on that? Because we do have at least one lawsuit in Georgia, plaintiff's lawsuit, basically a products liability lawsuit, among other things, that claims these are not natural numbers. These are being pumped synthetically. These are illegal controlled substances. What do you think is the case? So if there is language in the Farm Bill that bans synthetics, I'm actually not familiar with it. I know there is the U.S. Analogs Act, which essentially bans things that are attempting to mimic the result of intoxicating substances that are, or controlled substances. Again, I'm not an attorney, so don't take any of this as what the actual rules are. No, I'm certain there are a lot of people producing synthetic cannabinoids. That's not really not a question for me. You know, the, I think the only question really comes down to how much of the phytocannabinoids are being synthesized. So, you know, we, we can categorize this into wholly designer cannabinoids, which are not found in the plant at all and completely synthesized. And we can look at phytocannabinoids, which do exist in the plant, but sometimes are artificially created through uh, reaction chemistry. Minnesota is actually the only state I know that really has a rule around this, which is that they've divided those cannabinoids into two uh, categories, synthetic and artificial. So synthetic refers to anything created from reaction chemistry that is wholly not found in the, the plant actually occurring. That might be to be honest, I'm actually not sure which cannabinoids there are because there's a billion, you know, four, three and four letter acronyms now, but I think THCP, I'm not totally clear on where HHC comes from, if that's a phytocannabinoid or not. But Delta 8 is a good example of something that is a phytocannabinoid often created through artificial means. And I'm absolutely certain that people are creating those through artificial means. As far as I was aware, people are doing that legally to some extent. That's why I'm not that. I'd be surprised to hear that a ban on synthetics is actually included in the text of the farm bill itself. And I should clarify, maybe not in the text of the farm bill, the DEA's position. Oh, certainly. I mean, if you want to go in the DEA's position of things, almost everything is illegal under the, the farm bill that's not industrial hemp. The DEA has published letters or sent letters suggesting that their policy position is that anything above 0.3% at any point in the chain is uh, technically illegal. To date, I'm not aware that they've ever enforced that rule. There has been litigation, I believe, that has sort of established the concept that if it's hemp at the time it's grown, and that's you know 0.3, under 0.3% on specifically USDA you know, approved farm, you can't just grow marijuana. And if it's under 0.3%, call it hemp. It still has to be registered both with the DEA and the USDA. And the USDA has certain compliance rules, and those compliance rules also run into statewide hemp rules. If it is compliant hemp at that point, and if it is under the 0.3%, specifically Delta 9 THC threshold at the time that it is sold to a consumer, that uh, basically what we call the sourcing rule and the final product rule, then it is compliant hemp. But I don't believe that's consistent with the DEA's position. However, the DEA is not a lawmaking body. And so I'm not sure that they get to make that choice. Um, and if they you know, have decided that is their position, I'm not sure they feel confident enough to actually prosecute anybody over it, which is why we haven't really seen those. I mean, you referenced earlier that states have tried to ban hemp products and in many cases have failed. I think I've seen several different ways in which they've either restricted or tried to ban them. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, in Arkansas last year, there was a lawsuit to, to, you know, to overturn a ban that was overly vague and targeted, you know, things like synthetics and intoxicants. Uh, and essentially the federal judge ruled there that the farm bill essentially endows uh, consumers with the right to consume these products because it's federal law. Um, so the state could restrict people producing them, but they couldn't restrict consumers' right to consume them. And a similar rule, I think, uh, or it was a similar ruling in Maryland that overturned that ban also last year. Texas, this has been litigated a couple times, particularly surrounding Delta 8. But I think notably, Virginia has a ban on T Delta 9 THC above 2 milligrams per package. Colorado 
Colorado has one at 1.75 milligrams per package. New York has one at one milligram of THC per package and only if it contains 15 milligrams of CBD correspondingly. So there have been you know, restrictions on this that essentially have eliminated intoxicating hemp products, at least with Delta 9 THC. The problem is when you pass those rules, you kind of just influx the market with, you know, other illicit THC. It's the same thing as any prohibition, right? If you ban it, you only create a market for other things that you haven't accounted for. And so, or just straight up illegal products that people will sell anyway, lacking enforcement. If Delta ATHC has been banned in New York for years, but I guarantee I can drive to New York right now and find you some Delta ATHC sold at a smoke shop that the guy that's selling it to me will tell me it's legal. So it's, um, it's a mess. And speaking of enforcement, are you concerned about enforcement at all? Do I have nightmares sometimes? Sure. Um, I don't, you know, I feel pretty comfortable that where we are is is in a safe space where if there was some sort of law enforcement action, it'd be incredibly difficult for them to, you know, succeed with that in court. And I think we know that prosecutors tend not to want to prosecute cases that they don't think they can win. That doesn't mean there aren't, you know, potential actions the government could take. I've definitely seen stories out there of products being seized and such like that. And I've seen stories of people winning in court after those seizures. I think largely, you know, cantrip self-regulates. I, I, we test every batch for potency, microbials, mycotoxins, residual solvents, and pesticides. We sell them within the state, like parameters for state laws across the board. So I won't sell to a state that has a ban on it. I won't sell them direct to consumer. I won't sell them retail. And you know, by following all the laws that we believe exist, I feel like we're pretty well covered. You know, uh, the FDA is not also is also not a fan of selling THC across state lines any more than they're a fan of CBD. So we have sort of the same pair. I'm there. And I haven't seen them go after Charlotte's Web either yet. So to be honest, we, we exist in sort of a liminal state right now. And that's why I think so many lawyers are confused because even the ones that are experts on this, there's not a lot of clarity because a lot of it's going to come down to what actually happens in court when things get litigated. This has been a real crash course for me in, in where, you know, law meets practicality and how, you know, things that we take for granted as precedent in many, many laws across this country, they still they do have to be worked out every time you change, make material changes in a law. The, the Florida ban that just happened, that'll be challenged in court for sure. And while it doesn't really affect Cantrip in a material way, because the latest litigation would allow all the products that Cantrip currently makes, you know, there is a strong hemp lobby down in Florida, who I call the 34 flavors of ick, which is all these cannabinoids that we don't actually know, you know, know what they do to people. They're being sold in large amounts. We're talking about a multi-billion dollar market across this country and synthetic cannabinoids and those you know producers suppliers distributors and even consumers are not going to just let that go and it seems like let's table federal law for a minute ambiguities different interpretations people's paranoia whatever it amounts to being seems like the states again are the ones left holding the bag and supporting the net like a minnesota and minnesota is not the only one anymore that have embraced it full bore and are trying to regulate not de facto ban and that similar to adult use cannabis, the states are the ones that are going to design the ultimate policy of acceptance and then the feds will catch up. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely how it's going so far. Whether or not the feds cash up, I think is like we have state legislatures that because our federal government is constantly in its own sort of like state of Trump, of culture war and you know, particular issues that matter. You know, There's a reason that marijuana legalization is maybe one of the most bipartisan popular issues in the entire country. We still don't legalize marijuana. It's because when it's something's really popular, you can't beat the other party over the head with it all that much. It's not you know, particularly useful to most politicians at a federal level. Level. But at the state level, all politics is really local. So legislatures have been able to act. And in many cases, they have. What we've really seen is a big divide between essentially states that have already legalized cannabis and states that haven't. So, you know, this is in some ways sort of a red state cannabis phenomenon. Minnesota has the most explicitly permissive structure in the country. Maybe one of the the only one that I'm aware of off the top of my head that actually mentions Delta 9 THC in the text of the law. Tennessee permits it and has a pretty permissive structure, but it actually calls things intoxicating cannabinoids instead of you know referencing when you go to file your taxes in Tennessee for these products because there's a specific I think six percent tax on the retailers' products. You can they have a drop down menu and it says Delta eight and it says Delta ten, but you, there's no Delta nine on that, which is common I think. What's interesting, it's been tougher in states where there are dispensaries existing, right? They want to protect that business instead of the dispensaries. It's a silly game, to be honest, because in the long term, I don't think they're going to be able to fight these forever. And so these products are going to be in liquor store and grocery channels at some point or another, in some fashion or another. But Minnesota has adult use cannabis, but they haven't opened any dispensaries yet. So there's nothing to protect. So it'll be one of the first states to watch that. It's essentially split the market into an edibles market that is freely accessible to anyone who can walk 
to a liquor store and any liquor license you can sell it versus getting flour and concentrates, which will remain federally illegal, but you know, sold in those dispensaries. Whereas it's going to be a tougher push, I think, in you know, the Northeast. California actually allows these products, which is interesting, but it hasn't become widespread there just yet. But we're definitely seeing the South become a strong marketplace for us. That's incredible. It's just incredible. It's not anything I would have ever believed in the past decade. And to that point, you know, last couple of questions for you. What do you think, because this is pretty legally rocky and unpredictable, volatile, although maybe less volatile than adult use cannabis in some respects, what's been Cantrip's biggest success to date, in your opinion? I mean, I think the most impactful success that we've had was becoming one of the first brands on uh, total wine and more shelves back in October. It's the first national liquor retailer to take on cannabis brands selected us. We were one of only four on their shelves that were not local to Minnesota as well. Most of those brands were, you know, homegrown. I think that was was of interest to them at the time. But we were an out-of-state brands. We did have our entire supply chain in Minnesota at that time, and Total Wine picked us up on the strength of our products and our sales. I mean, moving in, being one of the first movers into the hemp space after that Minnesota decision, I think was one of the best decisions that we made to date and really has driven our business. I'm not sure we would exist still if we were just in the dispensary system. The, the cost of opening a new state, even if you are a co-packed brand and not opening your own license is just, you know, it's measured in the six figures. And unless you can continually fundraise, which is, I think, getting harder in today's capital environment, there's really no path for small businesses, I think, in adult use cannabis. And there, therein lies the crux of the issue where a lot of people will cry foul at hemp and say, you know, this is averse to our social equity goals. In fact, I don't think there's an adult use cannabis program that's really nailed social equity in one way or another because it's so disastrously expensive. Expensive. I mean, I always look at Cambridge, which I think eventually did succeed in getting some social equity applicants open, but there was essentially a moratorium for years in Cambridge, Massachusetts over, you know, you had to be a social equity or economic empowerment applicant to open up there. They were essentially asking the poorest people in the state to open in the most expensive rent market in the state. And so how, is, how do you square that? You have to raise a lot of money. And those people, basically, they're giving away 49% of their company half the time when they're raising that money because it's incredibly difficult. And so you just end up with, you know, moneyed interest de facto running the the, all these adult use programs, but no ability to survive for the small mom projects. I mean, recently there was that that company that was caught on camera talking about how they don't pay their bills because they just wait for the mom and pop shops to go out of business. That in many ways, you know, does, that happens a lot. It's not uncommon to be overextended. Cantrip has had AR from dispensaries that numbers in the 150,000 range before people, we would extend net seven terms and people would pay 60 to 90 days later, or, you know, we would ship multiple orders before they even considered paying part of it. And so that kills a lot of small businesses. There's really no path for a lot of these companies and margins are just squeezed really hard on manufacturers and suppliers. So, you know, being part of the hemp system where we work with alphabet distributors that, you know, they generally pay right on 30 days or even sooner sometimes. It's not really, a, they're so established, it's not really a question if they can pay their bills or not. And being able to operate in a direct to consumer environment where essentially the money flows directly to you, our cash cycles have, have shortened dramatically and that has improved the health of the business and allowed us to expand. And we were, we had our first profitable year in 2023 and we expanded 565 percent in revenues big difference <laughs> big, big difference b2b and on the back of that and i just have two more questions for you number one do you think more multi-state operators on the adult use state license side will start exploring launching products in the hemp industry uh, you know especially as having seen what cantrip has been able to do i mean i'm sure everybody would love to partner with total wine <laughs> Sure. I mean, a lot of them have. This is not really even a question for them anymore. GTI launched their Minnesota product, their hemp derived products in Minnesota, despite being one of only two medical licensees. I think they saw there's no way they were going to compete with the edibles market. Otherwise, they, you know, they have the Incredibles brand, which is a very strong chocolate bar brand. But even recently, I've seen pictures of them on shelves in smoke shops in Illinois with their with an Illinois hemp license attached. Which is ironic, because as far as I am personally aware, I think they are also spending a lot of money lobbying against hemp derived products in Illinois because. They have a big business to protect there. But we know Kiva Confections has launched in the hemp space. 1906 is launched in the hemp space. Cure Leaf has a hemp derived THC and to their brand. So I think it's inevitable that everybody's going to do it. How they go about it and how they try to separate that business away from their 280E bound business is, I think, a more complicated question. But at the end of the day, I see a lot of people in the dispensary space crying foul about this. I get it. I've watched people get licenses. I participate in that process. It sucks. It takes years. The beverages are one, less than 1% of revenue with dispensaries. It's such a small proportion of business. It's really the meat. They add up like the chocolate bars and gummies. I think they're mostly worried about. And I think there's there are intelligent ways to solve this through policymaking. I don't know that there's any policymakers out there interested 
interested in solving that problem in an intelligent way, but there's absolutely, you know, good ways that we can make quality product. And I think you'll see a pretty much every major brand operate in that space because there's more total addressable market. And then if people really like it and they see GTI attached to Incredibles, maybe they want something stronger, they walk right into a GTI dispensary. So I think it's a win-win for everybody if we do it right. That would be a nice scenario. Okay, last question, specifically around beverages. Do you think the kinds of THC-infused beverages that you all are making on the hemp-derived side, do you think that's the future and why? In April of 2022, Boris Jordan got up on stage in Miami at Benzinga and said that he believed that cannabis beverages would be 50% of the cannabis market in the future. And everybody panned him for that. At the time, I think it had just been announced that this bill was working its way through the Minnesota legislature. So I don't know if Boris is getting briefed by his staff, you know, things like that or not. But the timing seems pretty close on it. It was also right at the time that Cureleaf would go to try to launch a beverage product in Massachusetts. So he could have just been, you know, self marketing But my point being that most people do not want to move towards a smoking lifestyle or an inhalation lifestyle. There's only nine compounds that are on the FDA approved excipient list for inhalation. You know, there's thousands and thousands of things you could put in a pharmaceutical product that the FDA has approved. Only nine of them can you inhale. Inhalation is not a great method for staying healthy. I think a lot of people don't want to smell like smoke. I think it's hard to control it. I think it's a phenomenal way of ingesting if you're comfortable with it, but it's hard to get people there. It takes a lot of education, a lot of training. I think a beverage is the simplest and easiest thing to explain to somebody. Just open it, drink it, see how you feel in 10 to 15 minutes and move forward. It's a lot of advantages over traditional edibles. It sets in faster. I, it can be it's more easily understood by distributors on how to distribute it. If you go to Total Wine and More, you can buy gummies right now uh, in Minnesota. What you're going to do is you're going to pick up like a card off a shelf and you're going to take that card to the register and then they're going to hand you the gummies as opposed to you know having live beverages on the shelf. Uh, Outbev distributors are picking up beverages. I haven't seen them pick up, a ton of them pick up gummies. It's because they know how to do this. There's a pre-existing infrastructure network for doing this across the entire country. And it's that coupled with consumer demand is something interesting and something new that I think is going to get the can of curious into the market. Because to be honest, I still think there's a large multiple people outside the cannabis market today that are interested that would come in if they only they found the pathway in then there are actually people in it you know what is what a 50 billion dollar u.s market right now i think could be a 250 dollar billion dollar u.s market but those other 200 billion dollars of revenue don't know how to get there and i think beverages are the pathway in for them well I will certainly be watching the Can of Curious and Can Trip. I think it's a wild ride, arguably maybe the faster catalyst to definitely better availability of cannabis-related products. And states, since they've gotten their crash course with adult use, may eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, do a better job with hemp-derived products as they regulate. But we'll be watching. Thank you, Adam, for coming on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Hillary. It's good to meet you. And that concludes today's episode of the Cannabis Law Now podcast. Until next time, stay alert, stay alive.